Hello and welcome to my critical let's play on a little game called The Good Time Garden. My name's Vanessa and this is probably one of my absolute favorite indie art games right now because it's hand drawn, frame by frame, and it's just unsettling and wacky in the best way possible. So for some background information on the game before we get started, The Good Time Garden is a short and surreal experience made by two guys named James Carbutt and Will Todd. The whole game takes about 15 minutes to play, but the stylization of the world and its features transported me to make it feel completely immersive during those few minutes. It's also very casual and lets you proceed at your own pace so you can really appreciate the atmosphere, animations, character and object designs, and honestly, just appreciate the music as well. So let's hop in, shall we? Prepare to get mooned by a little naked boy that we'll be playing as for the rest of the game. So the controls are your basic WSAD to move, spacebar for slapping things, which is very essential, N for spouting water from your nose, and M to pick up or drop or feed items. The mechanics are simple, clean, and provide players with hints on how to go about figuring out the puzzles. So after watering that plant, the frog wants a little taste of its milk and kindly makes us a bridge to proceed through the map. Easy but aesthetically pleasing games can be appealing to players that just want to unfold a structured narrative while getting the satisfaction of being rewarded. In The Art of Contested Spaces by Kurt Squire and Henry Jenkins, they talk about how game worlds manipulate the player experience, and here, we can see that this game takes a predetermined approach to spatial exploration. So we interacted with this little mushroom guy, and I'm kind of getting emotionally attached to it because it's relying on us to get from point A to point B. But alas, we have to feed it to this flesh lord, who wants us to find him more food to feed on. In a sense, this game kind of touches on themes of detachment, disappointment, yet the thrill of satisfying a motive in hopes of completion. It really gets players used to the idea that we are not the heroes in this game, and we're here to help sacrifice innocent creatures for the greed of the big flesh monster. There's a sense of moral ambiguity here because we're just the messengers between the weak and powerful. This is really interesting to me because the overarching idea of this game can also be seen as an artistic metaphor for how humans as a species function to stay alive. We sacrifice the lives of innocent animals to feed our greedy mouths, or the weaker working class is used to satisfy the greed of the lazy people in power. It's even more interesting to me that the style of this whole game is based on discomfort and an unconventional representation of nature. It's a surrealist method meant to challenge how tangible we can make the imagination. Take this pink veiny tree for example that just pops out of the ground, or even this bird that's coyly covering its private parts. As humorous as it is, the element of surprise and the unexpected is a big factor that plays into the intended emotion that the creators want to give to the players. The confidence of these game elements that just expose themselves to the player is like revealing a vulnerability that we take advantage of to proceed with the game. One of the reviews that I read on Steam that I found really funny said that this game raised a desire in me to feed other people's children to an unknown entity I met a while ago. Even this part where we slap the tadpoles out of this lady and then take them back to feed to the flesh monster, as terrible as this might sound, we gain the confidence to just steal and almost violate this character because the game entities are vulnerable. Thus there are no consequences and we have one goal to reach completion, and as a player, our duty is to do what it takes to meet the requirement. Not to mention the praise and validation that we get from feeding the flesh monster, which makes it feel like we're doing the right thing. The learned power play paired with laboring for a goal kind of tunes into psychological desires and really is a commentary on how we strive for more and the things that we're willing to do when given the chance. Something else that I want to mention about this game is that to me, it very much feels like an experiential art piece. Robert Egbert did an article called Video Games Can Never Be Art and said that one obvious difference between art and games is that you can win a game, and that if there's an immersive game without points or rules, then it's simply not a game, but a representation of a narrative. While I mostly disagree because the visual aesthetics and experience of games can deliver messages to audiences the same way that other art forms do, I have to wonder what the Good Time Garden can be classified as, because while there is the goal of feeding the flesh monster, the game isn't really meant to be won or lost, in my opinion, but more so about exploring the space and immersifying yourself into the strange, dreamy atmosphere while guiding characters into the real wins and losses, which is to eat or be eaten. Personally, I'd still call it a game because of the tasks that we do to reach completion, but that doesn't make it any less of an art piece that dregs through a fake reality that mirrors ideas in our actual realities. 
Tying back into what I was saying about how uncomfortable yet somewhat pleasing the aesthetics are, I really appreciate how lively every aspect of the game feels. The leaves that sway, the blinking trees, all add to the Alice in Wonderland-esque personification of inanimate objects that add to the surrealist theme. There are also quite a few elements that appear somewhat sexual or phallic, but ultimately resemble natural parts of the human body and nature that are often underrepresented in as innocent a platform as an explorative cartoony indie game. The cute characters that have exposed breasts are painted in a 2D light that isn't meant to be sexualized, but more so as just a random character passing through. Now this part is just mean. We made a little friend here that wants to follow us on our journey, making it feel almost as if we'd gained an animal companion. But we know that we have to learn to let go, this isn't a permanent connection. While the gameplay itself isn't that complex, I think the themes, relationships between us and the other creatures, symbolic representations, and just that weird feeling that it gives players is complex enough as it is that it makes the game feel cohesive despite being so short. While it'd be interesting to see how the developers could make the game more complex, with say more mechanics, I think this short and sweet experience says what it needs to and works well as an indie art game. Aha, we've reached the end. So now that we've quenched the beast's hunger, we walk off into the light with zero context as to where we're going, which is truly a surrealist and dreamlike experience that we're now just waking up from. Thank you for watching my let's play, and I hope you enjoyed the good time garden.